So today we want to talk about convexity of sets and convexity of functions. The exercise that um, we want to be solving in the later part of today's session is concerned with the convexity of functions, very simple functions this week. And um, functionals that we use in variational calculus next week. So before we can talk about convexity of functions, let us first talk about convexity of sets. So the general setting, and it's now an abstract setting, but you, we will also cover some examples, is the following. So let, um, let V be a vector space. So um, think, for example, of uh, R to the N, so just uh, n-dimensional vectors, or integrable functions L1 of Rd. I think we have also covered uh, or seen the Sobolev space H1 on a domain omega, and so on. So this is, a, this is a general setting that allows us to take sums and scalar multiples of our vectors. Normally, our vectors will be functions. I, of course, I can add functions and I can multiply a function with a scalar. So now what is a convex set? So K is a subset of V. And I will give you First of all, um, an example of a, of a very simple convex set. C consider, for example, this ball. So this is a ball in R2. And now I take two, fun uh, two, two points in this uh, subset, so inside of this ball. So let me take a point here and a point here. And let me call these points X and Y. So X and Y are elements of the ball. So B should be a ball in R2. And I take two points. And of course, you can see I can connect those two points, these two points, with a straight and direct line. So this is the first thing. And then the most important observation for convexity is that this line completely lies within our set. So green, um, this is, so the green line is also a subset of B. So, and this is the line that connects X and Y. So taking two points from my set, the points of course already lie within the convex set B, but also the line that connects them. This is convexity of sets. So E as a subset of R2 is convex. Um, so what does this mean? More formally speaking, so for all points X and Y of my set B and all parameters alpha that come from the interval of 0, 1, the green line, so 1 minus lambda x plus lambda y, is an element of B. So I can also rewrite this so you can really think of it as a line that starts in x and continues with the parameter lambda in the direction of the um, well, of this difference y minus x. So you can think about a straight line, but it's not an infinite line, it's a finite one. And this finite line should be contained in B. So this is convexity of sets. So there are other examples. So another example would be for example, if I take um, a square in R2,
then the square, of course, will also be convex. And it does not, so convexity means it does not matter where these points lie. I can always draw the line connecting them and the line will also be a part of the convex set. Of course, not every subset of R2 is convex. A very simple example, you can see if you take the union of a, of a circle and a square. Then you can see here, there are two points here and here. Both points are elements of our set, but the line connecting them is not very, um, yeah, it's not, it's not completely contained in the set. It leaves the set here and it enters the set again here. So we have a problem. So this set here on the right hand side is not convex. while the one on the right hand side is still convex. So those are some, some easy examples and some examples that are more um, relevant for the methods that we cover here are, um, I, will, I will summarize in the following rule. And the rule goes that every vector space is convex. So now we, in the, in the above example, we just covered um, subsets of a vector space, but the vector space itself taken as a, as a set is convex. Why is that the case? Um, let us see one second here on the left hand side what, what, the, what, what we are uh, considering. So two points of my vector space, X and Y, then I just multiply them with a scalar. I do not leave the vector space with scalar multiplication and I add them together. The vector space is also closed with respect to addition. Um, so every vector space is con convex because it's closed with respect to addition and multiplication with scalars. And this is all I'm, I'm considering here. So, um, so in particular, a vector space is closed with respect to uh, convex combinations. In other words, convex set means a set that is closed with respect to convex combinations. And the convex combination is always um, an expression of the following form. So convex combination. A convex combination is a linear combination. Yeah linear combination of X and Y, but it's a special one. The linear factors need to add up to one. So now an example um, from our course. Think about, so I already talked about variational calculus. Let's now think about um, the example of denoising an image. Yeah. So now we want to concretize the setting that uh, I just abstractly talked about. Denoising means um, we, so with variational calculus means we are looking at the functional of the following form. J of U is the norm of U minus F plus lambda of gradient of u. So this is our data term. And this um, is our penalty term. So the first one, thinking about wishes, the first one tells us our denoised image u 
should be close to the original image f. So let me maybe do this. So u is candidate for denoised image. And f is the original. Yeah, so the first one is just an L2 norm. It tells us how close is our candidate to the original image. Yeah, the smaller this norm gets, the nearer I am, the closer I am to my original image. Yeah, of course, my image contains information. The closer I am to the original image, the less information I lose. But denoising also means smoothing and this is controlled by the second term, our penalty term. So now back to convexity. When I want to solve the denoising problem with a variational approach, I'm looking at, or I'm looking for the image u star, which is the minimal argument. So what? So this is a real number. So j u is a is a real number. And I want to find the function u that minimizes this functional. Yeah, so ju is a function that goes from, and we will see what set it is, to a real number. I want to minimize this real number. And for this, I take elements of a vector space. In our case, the uh, space h1, which is a Sobolev space, it's a vector space. That's all you need to know for now. In the lecture, we will cover Sobolev spaces in more detail. The important part here is I take elements of a convex set, I plug them into my functional, and I get a real number out of it. So why real numbers? Because then I can talk about minimizing um, with the outcome. Yeah. So. Uh, last week, we talked about how um, the idea of variational calculus is assigning a real number, so a, a very simple object, to a cumbersome object, with an, which in our case is a Zobolev function. So let me sum up. So this is the vector space, and in particular, a vector space is convex. This is the first example. So you already see convex sets come into play in variational calculus. And here, the convex sets comes into play in the role of or being a vector space. This does not need to be the case always. I have brought another example, um, which has also a variational approach, but not on a vector space. And this example comes from the chapter of restoration. In restoration, we also have two wishes. Oh, this was not copied completely. Uh, let me do it like this. So the two wishes that we have are, once again, our data consistency part. Ah, so, um, what is the what is the setting here? Let me also add a little sketch. So I have my image domain omega, and I have a small subset t of omega where the image information is completely lost. And I want to restore the information in d. So let me also maybe do this as a quick idea of restoration restore the info in D, which is a subset of Omega. And of course, while restoring the information, uh, we want to make sure we do not lose any more information. That means the data that is already there, so the data that is uh, in Omega without D, 
yeah, outside of this portion of the image where I have scratches, for example, this information is maintained. This is data consistency. And on the other hand, um, I also have here a smoothness condition that controls how I'm going to fill in the information into this portion D that uh, I do not know anything about. Yeah, I can just plug in information, of course, but this may introduce, um, well, large jumps, irregularities in my image, and I want to control it here. So how does the functional look like in this case? The functional is now, well, it, it, it looks similar to the one that we used for, um, for denoising, but now it only comes with uh, the term with a penalty term that controls the smoothness, which is quite odd. Where is the other wish? So the functional takes care of the first wish, um, uh, sorry, of the second wish, but what did happen to the first wish? The first wish is encoded in the domain of definition of our functional J. So J goes from, hmm, we need to find out, once again, to a real number, and the candidate, or the best candidate in this variational formulation that solves my restoration problem should be u star, the arc min of our functional j u, where u comes now from a set capital U, which I need to define here. And we should see that it captures the second wish. So this is... This is just repetition of information that we saw in the lecture. Therefore, I'm, I'm co just copying screenshots from the lecture notes. So the data consistency part is taken care of by the domain of definition U, capital U, of our functional J. And we see here, um, once again, a vector space structure as before, H1. But now we are not trying to minimize our functional j over the whole h1 as we did uh, in the denoising problem but on a subset u so u is a subset of h1 and how how do we interpret the um, the properties of the elements of the subset yeah they they need to encode the data consistency. So this is the second part. So maybe I do this with a little bit of color here. So the data consistency is encoded in this part here, which means, well, it's a very simple consistency condition. It tells us the part of U that is outside of D. Yeah, so the part of U that uh, lies in the set Omega without D. So sorry if if this is uh, this is boring you, but I'm just want want to complete this image here. So the part that lies in here should be equal to F. This is a perfect a perfect match. Yeah. So I do not have lost any information on my image outside of D. So the question is: Is this a convex set and as we will see in the lecture um, convexity for the domain of definition is an, an essential property so um, so let me formulate this problem so u capital u needs to be convex um, and don't confuse this with the convexity of, for example, the domain of a definition omega. Yeah, so this, this does not need to be the case. So we are just talking about the domain of definition of our functional J. So how do we show that U is convex? So, um, so we need to show that if I take a small u and small v 
in capital U, so of my set here, then um, U and V, uh, sorry, um, then alpha U plus one minus alpha V is an element of H1 of omega and alpha u plus 1 minus alpha v restricted to omega without of d equals f. So those are the two conditions that need to be fulfilled. So and this is, this is an easy calculation, um, but it's a, a little bit harder than convexity for vector spaces because convexity for vector spaces is already guaranteed by the properties of the vector space for a subset, we need to do a little calculation. So, so we take u and v in capital U. So that is, uh, so in particular, um, u and v are elements of H1. And we furthermore take a parameter alpha of our interval 0, 1. So then, by the properties of the vector space, alpha u plus 1 minus alpha v is an element of h1 of omega, so, because it's a vector space. But I also now need to take care of the uh, yellow condition here, so which means I need to show that alpha u plus one minus alpha v, when I restrict it to omega of d equals f. So I'm going to calculate this. So the restriction of the sum is nothing else than alpha times u restricted to omega without d plus one minus alpha of v restricted to omega minus uh, without d. So, but as u comes from capital U, this means the restriction of u is f. And the same holds for v. And now come, it comes into play that this is a convex combination. You can see here that the alpha term cancels out and what remains is just f. Yeah, so I also have now shown this, uh, this yellow condition here. Alpha u plus one, one minus alpha v, so this is the left part here. When I restrict it, I get out f again. Okay, so now we have talked about convex sets. Next, we want to talk about functions that live on a convex set, and those are convex functionals. And those are the functionals that we also work with in um, a variational calculus. So this is, again, a little bit abstract, but we have seen two examples above that were of the following um, type. So I have a functional j that goes from a set u to the real numbers. So the fact that it goes to real numbers, this tells us it's a functional. So it takes values in R. And u uh, is a convex set. And then convexity means that j of a convex combination is smaller or equal the convex combination of the function values. So what is happening here? So I take my functional j and I estimate it by the convex combination of um, the arguments. 
So what I have here is a convex combination in U. Therefore, U needs to be a convex set or a vector space, for example. And what I get as a result on the right-hand side is a convex combination in R. So R, of course, is also vector space, so it's also convex, so expressions of this type make sense. And I also want to highlight another thing. So I always have here this part alpha, one minus alpha, once inside the functional and then on the other hand, outside. And uh, if you think about it, what's, what this means is nothing else than um, if you have a curve and you take the function value at this curve. So this is the this point below here. We mark it with blue. Then this point is lower than the convex combination now of function values. So I come make the convex combination at the position alpha of the function values. And this is this is the, the just the, the picture that you sh should have in mind when talking about convex maps. So and now we want to talk about examples of convex maps. So this was once again abstract. We have seen examples of maps that should be convex or not. Those are the functionals that we use in variational calculus. And we want to take now a step back and consider more elementary examples that will provide to be useful uh, later on. So the first example is just a norm. Yeah, so when you think about when you think why we are covering these examples, think about if this may turn up when we uh, have a concrete uh, functional from um, variational calculus. So let's take a norm. So those are two bars, a dot in the middle that grows from a vector space X to R. Yeah, so a norm on a vector space. So the first check is obvious. X is a norm space uh, or X is a vector space. So it's a convex set and functional. So it maps, maps to R. So uh, is this a convex set? Hmm. So let's take two points, X and Y, in our vector space X. Let's take um, a scalar alpha in 0, 1. And um, so what do we need to show? We need to show that alpha times X plus 1 minus alpha Y in the norm is smaller or equal than the convex combination of the norms itself. So the first thing that we can do is maybe um, write down the goal. I already know how much steps I'm going to need, so I can give you the result. Um, so I want to show that this expression here on the left hand side is smaller or equal than the norm of alpha, uh, norm of x times alpha plus 1 minus alpha times the norm of y. Uh, so let me mark again the functional in our case. So the functional is the norm. So this is now our j here and the norm also in here. And I have a convex combination of arguments, so alpha and 1 minus alpha, and now they turn up again, but outside of the norm. Yeah? And now this is, this is a little ma mathematical calculation with properties of the norm. So I'm going to fill up these two gaps here. So the first step that we do is we use a triangle inequality. So we take care of this sum here inside the function. Okay, so this is the triangle inequality. And the next thing, the next property we know for norms is homogeneity, which means we can take out sky scalars in the norm. We can take out scalars from the norm with the absolute value. So this is homogeneity, taking out the scalar from inside the norm, writing it at front with the absolute value. And now here on the last part, what we use is that alpha is greater or equal than zero. So I can get rid of the absolute values here. Yeah, and this is just the assumption that I have here with alpha being from the interval zero one. So norms are 
convex maps. And if you think about our functionals that we have covered so far, um, all of them contain a norm. Yeah, so this one uses a norm and the one we had for denoising also uses a norm. So next example, I think this may still fit here. So the next example is uh, a, a simple function that you may already know to be convex from the graph, which is the map function that uh, maps x to x squared. Yeah, okay, and this is a function, of course, that maps real numbers to real numbers. So the real numbers are a convex set, so x mapping to x squared makes sense to check for convexity. And um, yeah, so there's an algebraic approach that um, that we can take here in order to check whether um, this function is strictly convex. So strict convexity is the same as convexity, but with a strict less sign, not with less equal. So what do we need to show here? Um, we need to show that alpha u plus 1 minus alpha v for two numbers, u and v in the reals, and alpha from the interval 0, 1, if I plug them into my function, those are both are less or equal than um, alpha times u squared plus one minus alpha times v squared. We once again highlight our uh, functional, so to say here. So the functional just takes a real number to the power of two. Also have it here on the right hand side. And the convex combination once inside the function, and then on the other hand with our um, with the other uh, the, also on the other hand I have the convex combination of the function values. So um, we can reformulate what we need to show here. So maybe let me add this also for, um, for a better understanding. So this inequality is something that we need to, we need to prove. And it's showing that this inequality holds is equivalent to showing that um, this other inequality here holds that I just get from uh, taking this right hand side here to the left, subtracting it. Um, in my upload, I will also give you the details of the calculation, but it's so it's a very easy calculation. It's basically just um, uh, resolving the parts that we have here algebraically, rearranging terms, and checking that this inequality here actually holds. Yeah, so the full calculation. Um, will come in my upload later. For the last example that we want to cover here, because it's also always a, a good um, good way to combine or to recycle uh, information about convexity, is um, the combination of a convex function with a affine linear function. So now I have two functions that uh, I'm, I'm working with. And the one function is called capital Phi, and it maps from u to v, to vector spaces. And Phi of u is defined as c plus a linear operator a times u. So c is an element of v, u is an element, of course, of capital U. And A goes from U to V and is also linear. So U and V are vector spaces. So let me also make a, um, a sketch. 
So I have this vector space u, I have a vector space v, and capital phi goes from u to v. And now assume that I have a functional that takes elements of v to the real numbers. Let us assume we already know that j is convex. And as said in the, um, in the, in the introduction here, um, phi is a fine linear. So this is nothing else than to say that phi is of precisely this form. A constant vector plus a linear operator um, applied to an element of the vector space here. And now the question is, if I combine these two functions, so if I go from u to r by the concatenation j after phi, is this still convex? So what do I need to do in order to show this? Well, once again, I need to take two elements of my vector space and a scalar between 0 and 1. And then I need to take a look at the screen function here, which is the concatenation, and show that this inequality holds for the convex combination of arguments and the convex combination of functional values. So the proof again is a little bit technical, but I think we still have time to cover it. So I'm going to do this proof in detail. So we start out with the left-hand side here. And now we are going to reformulate the parts here using a fine linearity and um, the convexity of uh, J here. So let me also have this information here on the left-hand side. So how do we rewrite this? So let us first start by um, resolving uh, this concatenation. So this is nothing else than j of phi of alpha u plus 1 minus alpha v. Very good. Now we use the definition of phi, which is nothing else than using a constant c and then a linear operator a applied to the argument alpha u plus 1 minus alpha v. Okay, so this is nothing else than, so let's say here, this is the definition of concatenation, and this here is the definition of our affine linear function phi. So now, next thing I'm going to use is the linearity of a. So this means a applied to Alpha u is nothing else than alpha times a u, and the plus sign also works here, and it gives me a 1 minus alpha times a applied to v. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to rewrite the 1 in front of the c as 1 minus alpha plus alpha. So this one is alpha times c, and here I'm going to use 1 minus alpha c plus the rest. And you see those two terms add up to the one in front of the C before. All right, so why did, did we do it like that? Um, so we now have, we now want to use the convexity of J and I'm going to mark this with a, with a different green tone here. So now I have a functional J here and I have a convex combination. Um, so maybe let me also rewrite this as a as a side note here. So this here is nothing else than alpha times C plus AU. And this part here is nothing else than one minus alpha C plus AV. Yeah, so this is again the convex combination alpha one minus alpha here. So I can use as already announced the convexity of J. And what this gives me is, well, just by definition, alpha j c plus a u plus 1 minus alpha j of 
C plus AV. So let me mark this again. So the alpha comes out of our functional and the functional itself is now applied to those single vectors C plus AU and C plus AV. This is the convexity of J. So and now what we need to do is just rewrite everything that is here because recalling the definition of phi again, what we have here is nothing else than J of phi of U. Now, this is just the definition here. Phi of U is C plus AU. This is what the argument of J is here. And on the right hand side, we have one minus alpha J of phi of V. All right, and now we use, as before, the definition of the uh, concatenation symbol, and this means alpha j after phi of u plus 1 minus alpha j after phi of v. So now with the different, with the darker green, we we started out, so maybe let's get lost of this, of this first line here. We started out with j after phi, of this convex combination. And again, I have j after phi here. And now the convex combination of the values of j after phi of u and j after phi of v. So we start out with this. Now let us look at the, at the relation symbols that we used. Equal, 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 less or equal, equal, equal. This means I have precisely shown this inequality here. To sum up, if I have a convex function and a fin, a fin linear function that I can um, um, concatenate in the following way, then the concatenation is still a convex function. All right, that it's, that's it for today.